My name's Andrew Hicks, as she also said. Um, yeah, I'm going to be presenting on the Zapatistas. Who here knows who the Zapatistas are? Anyone? Two people? <laughs> okay, so a little context. This is Mexico, if you didn't know. <laughs> the Zapatistas are located in the Chiapas, which is this state of Mexico right here. Um, one of their biggest cities that they kind of have a lot of influence over is San Cristobal de las Casas. So some of you might be kind of confused by the title, be like, why did I put the end of history with a question mark? And it's kind of a jab at a well-known phrase by political theorist Francis Fukuyama in the 1990s that said the end of the Cold War would bring in an age of neoliberal capitalist democracy in the world and there'd be harmony and no one would complain. And I think it's kind of ironic that a group of Indians that were forgotten in the state of Mexico and were some of the poorest in the state were the ones to kind of be like, we have problems with that and kind of revolt. So once again, here's Mexico. Remember, the Zapatistas are down here. You might need to know that for later on in my presentation. Well, here's Oaxaca too. I'll mention Oaxaca. So, so who are the Zapatistas? Um, they're also called the EZLN, which stands for in English, the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. And they follow in the legacy of Emiliano Zap Zapata, who I have pictured right here, this dude with this glorious mustache. So they're predominantly composed of indigenous members of Mexico, which is kind of remarkable for a revolutionary movement, especially in the Latin American context, because most of them didn't really gain recognition, or at least they didn't have the longevity that this group has had. And they follow in Zapata's legacy in the manner that in the, 19, or in the Mexican Revolution of the 1910s to 1917, um, Zapata was a hero of the Mexican Re Revolution. More importantly, he was a champion of the indigenous people of Mexico. Um, he wanted autonomy, he wanted the sustainment for the way of life, and he wanted, he didn't want the state power. He wanted autonomous control over indigenous regions. He wanted control over the resources, control over the land. If you worked it, you owned it. That was one of his mottos. And he just, he wanted these people to continue to live the way that they wanted to live instead of having to really just assimilate, but really just change their entire way of life for the Mexican state. So as I said, their name stems from Zapata, Zapatistas. <laughs> if I have to explain that, that's going to be a long presentation. So <laughs> they were founded in the 1980s, really. Um, the interesting thing about the Zapatistas is their spokesperson, quote unquote, it's a lot more complicated than I can, it's, it's, I can't explain it. It's really complicated. But their spokesperson is an educated man from the city of Mexico. He was a professor in one of the universities. And in the 60s, especially in the late 1960s, after the student massacre, not student massacre, after the massacre and the culture of three plazas in Mexico City before the um, Olympics in 1968, a lot of Mexican professors felt threatened by the state. They felt threatened by the military. So they fled to the countryside, they fled to these poor regions hoping to foment a Marxist-Leninist revolution. But as Marco soon found out, the Zapatistas weren't exactly workers in the traditional sense, and they had no idea what he was talking about, and they were just like, why is this white guy trying to take our stuff? It's kind of a long history of white people coming to them and saying, hey, we have something new for you, and then they get well screwed, to put it bluntly. So. A little more, the EZLN is actually kind of the military arm of the, Zap of the Zapatista movement. There's a thing called the Clandestine Revolutionary Indigenous Committee, which is like a grassroots democratic organization where they have to run all their decisions through this council. And if they decide on it, they'll do it. And if they don't decide on it, they won't do it. So that's really interesting in the context of Latin American revolt because you see a lot with Cuba and Nicaragua. It was a vanguard party who started these revolutions. And it might have had support of the, the majority of the population but afterwards, they kind of took and consolidated power and did things the way they wanted it. So why, oh, I actually have a quote to explain this movement really well. It's a quote from Subcomandante Marcos, who's, like I said, the spokesperson, quote unquote, in the movement. He says, I am like I am and you are like you are. We can create a world where I can be me without having to stop being me and where you can be without having to stop being you and where we are not obligated to each other to be like me or like you. And this kind of just, it kind of is confusing, but I mean, the guy's a big fan of Don Quixote. He's a really confusing character in his writings and his letters to people. It's kind of, you can tell he's a philosophy professor because he makes no sense <laughs> a lot of the time. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I want to say before I get really too far into it is 
It's really hard and difficult to understand this movement through the lens of a European political system or movement. I'm, some people like to juxtapose like, oh, they're Marxist, oh, they're anarchist, oh, they're this, they're that. A big part of their movement is their identity as Indians. Um, it might fit with some models of you know, Western political thought, but more than anything, their conditions, their history is what led them to this. So why did they revolt? Um, they say it started with La Conquista, so the conquest of the New World New World by the Spaniards, the, I don't know, is it, is it controversial to call it a genocide still? The genocide that ensued of Native Americans, especially in Latin America, the taking of their property, the taking, well not property, the taking of their land, the taking of the resources to make the Spanish Empire richer, and then the Mexican state richer. So they didn't want it to assimilate into Mexican life in a way that would just destroy their life. And they were upset by the lack of alternatives, and until 1917 there really was a lack of alternatives, especially when the Mexican state started consolidating more power. So the state of Chiapas is actually one of the richest in Mexico with natural resources. They have a lot of oil reserves, <laughs> which oil makes people rich, as we all know. So even with this, they were extremely poor. They were one of the poorest states in Mexico. They had some of the worst health care, some of the worst education. And to them, they felt forgotten. They felt like their voice didn't matter. They felt like local laws disrespected them. They felt like local authorities disrespected them. They were harassed a lot by business leaders in the area, by the state police in the area. So past the feeling of being forgotten, their way of life became threatened in 1994 with the passing of NAFTA and the inaction of NAFTA at the turn of the year between 1993 and 1994. And who knows what NAFTA is? Do I have to? Okay. So NAFTA stands for the North American Free Trade Agreement. It's between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And like it sounds, it enacts free trade between these countries. But in Mexico, it was going to threaten Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution. And what that says is that in 1917, because a lot because of Emiliano Zapata, the, Mexican, the new Mexican Constitution said that indigenous people had right to their land and to their territory and to communal land. And to them, this was huge. This kind of guaranteed at least some aspects of their way of life. And NAFTA promised to privatize a lot of their land. And to them, this was like, as Mar Marcos actually put it bluntly, that it would have been a summary execution of thousands of indigenous people in the south of Mexico. I mean, they might not have died, it might be an overstatement, but it would have really further destroyed their cultural identity and what they were. So, along with NAFTA, of course, with free trade, becomes deregulation of industry. So more extraction from the state of Chiapas, more dirty extraction from the state of Chiapas, and still less money goes to them because as we've all seen in the past 30 years with neoliberalism with, with these passes of these trade acts, it doesn't really benefit the population at large. It benefits a few people who already have a lot of resources. So I, just, I can't get over this mustache. I'm, I'm sorry about that. It's just glorious. So, they wanted to maintain the way of life against NAFTA and the incoming of neoliberalism in Mexico. So, on January 1st of 1994, they came out of the jungles in the morning and they captured several cities in the state of Chiapas. And one of the most notable is San Cristobal de las Casas, which is one of the biggest cities in Chiapas. And they captured it long enough to get the government's attention and to issue communiques saying what they wanted and to say why they have grievances. And then a lot of them left and they went back into the jungle because they realized they couldn't fight the Mexican, the Mexican army. I mean, I think I have it on this slide. What do you see with these guns? Do they look real? They're wooden guns. They're fake cutouts of guns to look intimidating. A lot of these people didn't have guns. And the, the an interesting thing is in a lot of videos you watch, a lot of people who the Mexican government, or the army kills are these people without guns because even they look like real, they're not. So this is kind of a... It's terrible because they couldn't actually defend themselves, but it's also kind of the, the paradox, the, the hard thing that's hard to understand about this movement is they're willing to look violent, but they don't want to use violence. They're willing to use arms, but they don't have a lot of arms. <laughs> so in one of the states in Chiapas, in San Cristobal de las Casas, they didn't face a lot of violent retaliation, but in one of the states, Os I, I actually, I can't pronounce it right, but there was brutal repression. Dozens of Zapatistas died and a lot of civilians died. And the Mexican army did retaliate brutally against these people. They did bring helicopters. They brought in um, troops. They brought in APCs. 
But a lot of people in Mexico protested this because they're like, they're indigenous people. They don't have guns. <laughs> they're already like the poorest of our nation. And you're killing them because they're mad that they don't have rights. And this kind of stopped the Mexican army from retaliating like it could have. And on top of this, there was global protest. I mean, you have to remember this was a time where a couple of years later in Seattle, they'd have those protests against globalization, against the economic aspects of it. So it was kind of a time of renewed protests around the world, especially after the era of Reagan and Thatcher and Britain and the United States. So like I said, they used fake weapons, a lot of them did, which is, <laughs> I mean, they look real, but it's, it's really interesting. I mean, that one doesn't even look real. That one's just a stick. But from a distance, you might think it's a gun. So in comparison to the revolutions in Cuba and Nicaragua, this is like, <laughs> this is completely different in a lot of aspects. Um, in Cuba and Nicaragua, the reasons they revolted were predominantly because there's brutal dictatorship in place installed by the United States, and Cuba was Batista, Nicaragua was the Somoza family. Um, U.S. imperialism, as I kind of just mentioned, the U.S. controlled a lot of aspects of Nicaragua and Cuba's economy, of their political system, and these economies weren't built to help everyone in the country. They were built to enrich in a few, and Nicaragua is kind of like nepotism. A lot of the people who are close to the Somoza family are the ones who get the most money. When there's an earthquake in the capital of Nicaragua in the early 70s, most of the relief aid went to these families, or they rebuilt the city in the ways that it would just benefit these families. So that's kind of similar to the Chiapas because, I mean, economic impoverishment. I'm, I mean, just the fact that they can't buy guns should just tell you something. Um, and then the last thing in Nicaragua and Cuba that's kind of similar to the Zapatistas is the fact that they wanted popular participation in their politics. And Cuba didn't really happen, at least on the federal level, now under the revolution. And in, but in Nicaragua, the Santa Luis was voted out of office in 1990 because the Santa Luis actually did enact some form of democracy. So what I just said should kind of say something. In Cuba and Nicaragua, there were vanguard parties that led these revolutions against the state, against the power. But in the Chiapas, it was they had to get approval from the people that they were representing, and then they could go revolt. Whereas in Cuba, Nicaragua, it was the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and the July 26 movement. And they kind of, even though they still had popular participation in their movement, they were the ones who led it, and they were the ones who took state power afterwards. So I told you how they revolted and kind of why they revolted, but what were their goals of this revolt? And you could probably already make an educated guess of what their goals were. Um, this is actually interesting. This was a speech, in a speech a couple months after the Zapatistas rebelled. Marcos was given a speech who's kind of, like I said, their persona. And he's like, you know, here's our soldiers. They're going to give you a Zapatista salute. And they came out with guns or sticks with white flags on the end, <laughs> which is kind of a, it's, it's really confusing. But he said, you know, we have arms, but they're arms who don't want to be used. They want to be proved useless. And it's kind of, like I said, this guy's really confusing. The movement's really paradoxical if you try to look at it through a European mindset or a Western mindset, because you're like, why would you want guns and then you put flags in them and they're not, like half of them aren't even real. Why would you threaten a major state? Why would you threaten their army? But it was because of their goals. They wanted local economy over their resources, over their communities. They wanted to preserve their way of life, which was threatened by NAFTA. So past this, they also wanted to gain attention to their plight. Because like I said, they were the, some of the most impoverished people in Mexico. And they didn't have a lot of indigenous rights past these ejido lands, past these communal lands. Like even though Mexico is highly pluralistic with their cultures, it really wasn't protected underneath the federal constitution, at least for them. So like I said, they wanted the assurance of Article 27 of the Mexican constitution that, pro that guaranteed them the preservation of their communal land. And there was a thing they wanted passed called the San Andres Accords, which aimed to have the Mexican state re respect their diversity. Um, preserve their natural resources, allow more indigenous input in the allocation of public expenditures, allow them to make their own development plans, and allow them to participate more in state affairs that would directly affect them. So they wanted an, an increase in local democracy. They, they wanted, I mean, one of the interesting things is <laughs> they, 2006, they ran a campaign during the Mexican elections, during their presidential time going up to their elections, and they were like, you know, 
we don't support any federal candidate because they're not going to do anything. It's really going to be long lasting. What you have to do is from the grassroots level, you have to demand it. You have to build it in your communities and then it'll reflect itself in the state. And they got a lot of flack for that because one of the candidates for one of the more leftist parties in Mexico was like, they're taking my votes. They're telling people not to vote for me. But they <laughs> never endorsed the candidate. They never said really anything too terrible about, about the guy. So one of the most interesting things is, even though it was a revolt against the Mexican state, they still wanted to work within the Mexican state. So they actually called for increased democracy in the whole state of Mexico. I mean, at this point, the PRI was the governing party of Mexico for over 70 years since the revolution. They also wanted an end to corruption, which kind of goes along with the, the increase of the drug trade in Mexico and just in the fact that there's a lot of corruption, especially in these parts that were closer to Guatemala, that were in the southern parts that didn't have, I mean, that were really full of Indians. They, they were, like I said, they were harassed constantly. Their laws weren't exactly favorable to them. So this was, again, a departure from the previous leftist revolutions in, in Latin America because they worked within the context of the Mexican state. In Cuba and Nicaragua, they said, we're taking over the state. We're taking the state power. And in Cuba and Nicaragua, they wanted to end U.S. domination of their economies and their politics, whereas in the Zapatista case, it was a domestic problem. It stemmed back to the beginnings of colonialism to the, through the state, the establishment of the state of Mexico, um, past the 1917 Constitution, and it was into today with things that were just more and more threatening their way of life that they wanted to preserve. So they did kind of do some things that were similar to Cuba and Nicaragua. They wanted better health care, better education. They wanted more literacy like they did in Nicaragua and Cuba. That was actually one of the first reforms they passed in both countries was to make the country literate. And they wanted land, which is similar. That's kind of a revolutionary slogan, land, bread, and <laughs> I forget what the other one was that goes back to Vladimir Lenin. So the next part of my presentation is the end part, and that is these people today. Because you'd think with the state as powerful as Mexico, even though the Mexican army doesn't really compare it to our army, I mean, we spend $500 billion a year on our military. It'd be kind of hard for anyone to. They're still really powerful. So you think that if the Mexican state would have wanted them removed, which a lot of people did, um, Salinas, who was the president during the passing of NAFTA, wasn't too friendly to them. Fox, and his, you might have heard about Fox lately with NAFTA, and he likes to <laughs> talk trash to Trump. Even though he promised that there wouldn't be a Mexican without these people in the future, he didn't have passed the San Andreas Accords. He really, after his presidential, like after he got elected, he kind of forgot about them again, or he kind of just, they weren't his priority like he said they would be. So, they do have their autonomous zones in Mexico today, but they're not recognized by the federal government like they wanted them to be. Actually, in 2015, the governor of Chiapas, which is where they are, said, even though we recognize it on the state level, you need to recognize it on the federal level. And I think that's kind of recognition that it's not going to last forever if it's just the state, because if they have somebody come into power in the state of Chiapas that doesn't like the Zapatistas, doesn't like what they're doing, because a lot of people are upset that they have control of these resources and that they're the ones who have control of it because they want these things to, um, for personal gain. So they also have this thing called the National Indigenous Council now, which is supported by the Zapatistas. It's, like I said, it's really confusing. It's really complicated again. <laughs> that should, if you come away with anything, it's that this movement is confusing. So they plan to run a female indigenous candidate for the 2018 Mexican presidential elections, which is kind of a huge thing. A lot of people in Mexico, some of the guys in politics, I'd say guys, and I mean it, not just, you know, the thing that means all people, are upset because, A, they're like, well, they're not even a part of Mexico. They want to be autonomous, even though, like I've said, they do want to be a part of Mexico. They just want to have control over their lives. They're like, oh, it's, they don't bluntly say it's because it's a female indigenous candidate, but they say, oh, she can't even speak Spanish right. And it's, their rebuttal is, well, our president doesn't even speak Spanish like a Mexican, so what's your problem? And it's not one of those things where you bluntly say it, but it's pretty obvious why they're upset. They also, some of the candidates also think that they're going to take away their vote to make them lose. Manly Operador, who is the Social Democrat candidate in Mexico who blames the Zapatistas for him losing in 2006 and 2012, I believe. No, even before that. I mean, this guy's just got a personal vendetta. And I don't know if you guys follow the news too much in Mexico, but in 2016 there was a teacher strike that was repressed by the Mexican army. They actually sent in helicopters and there was videos of them from the Black Hawk helicopters given by the U.S. or bought from the U.S. 
where they'd shoot down tear gas and they'd hit these protesters to try to disperse them, but they were just protesting the neoliberal reforms underneath, um, I forget the president of Mexico's name, I'm blanking. Yeah, yeah, Benny Nieto. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> and they actually delivered three tons of food, which is kind of remarkable, because like I've said, they're extremely poor. And some people say that they're still at the same level of poverty they were in the 90s. I would disagree. I mean, even if it doesn't show in their economic growth, I mean, in just the human growth, they have a, to them at least, from what I can gather from it, they feel like they have more control over their lives and they can live them like they want to. So a little bit more, as I see here, I say neoliberalism. Since neoliberal, liberal, neoliberalism was really the big reason they rebelled in the first place, I just wanted to touch slightly on its impact on Mexico and on the world in general and the United States. So neoliberalism was, in case you don't know what it is, it was really pushed as a economic agenda and political agenda in the 70s. It started in Latin America. That's kind of where it was like, it tried out on states of Argentina in Chile through dictatorships and then Reagan and Thatcher applied it to the United States and the UK and it's really characterized by privatization and further commodification of life. You know, you're not supposed to have state industries. Anything that's public is bad. I'm sure you can hear that today in our political rhetoric. So neoliberalism in Mexico caused, according to the CEPA, which is the Center for Economic and Policy Research, 20 million people to fall into poverty, a rise in immigration to the USA that really ended around 2001. Um, an increase in the poverty rate and wages that were stagnant when adjusted for inflation that were the same in 1994 as they were in 2014. So even though it promised economic growth, it might have grown, the economy might have grown, but the human economy didn't, besides for a few people. Um, in the United States, the CEO wage in 1970 was 30 to 1. From CEO to worker in today, it's 500 to 1. And globally, today, eight people own as much wealth as 3.6 billion people. Whereas in 1996, 358 people owned the same wealth as 2.3 billion people. So that's a huge wealth disparity. It's grown in countries like Mexico and in some parts of Latin America, even though they did have a, they called it the pink tide. It was the more leftist tide with their economies in Latin America that kind of tried to re redistribute the wealth to the people. And actually Oxfam just reported that after analyzing the IMF policies and the economic trends of the past 20 years, that trickle-down economics does not work, regressive taxes fail, um, they need to have, or money needs to be more in the hands of the people in general instead of the hands of a few, and there needs to be more redistributive taxes. And that's the end of my presentation. Now I get to use the pointer. All right. All right. All right. Now I'm going to laser someone who has a question. Anyone got questions? All right, you, Dr. Tool. I missed you with the laser, but I tried. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for your presentation. Um, there was a lot of interesting information there. And Thank it's you. an important subject. Um, so here's my question. Um, I appreciate that uh, a lot of things about the movement are confusing, and <laughs> certainly the ideology is one of them. I was yeah. wondering, though, if you could speak a little more specifically about the sort of tension between, on the one hand, the traditional economic focus of Marxism, and on the other hand, the identity politics that is not traditionally part of Marxism, but obviously is very important in this movement. And obviously, we see a real mix of those two things here, but I'm wondering, are there factions within the movement, some of which are more economically oriented, some of which are more oriented toward identity politics? Is Marcos's thinking <laughs> sort of, I, I yeah. respect that it's probably quite, you know, um, you know, somewhat confusing, but can you detect any sort of balance uh, or, oh, or way in which he leans? And also, yeah. maybe there's some division between uh, the the ideology of, of people in power as opposed to people on the streets. Um, that was a lot, Dr. Tool. Um, well, <laughs> the point is, it's a simple, yeah, simply yeah. focus. It's a simple question I mean, about economics versus identity. I, to an extent, I don't think it really falls outside the realm of Marxism. I mean, even Marx in the 1800s was saying that conditions change based on situation to situation. I'm just explaining what happened in, in Western Europe and what I think caused the development of the world. I mean, there was a part in the German ideology where he says philosophizing too much is like self-gratification. The point is to actually examine these things and decide based on what you see. So I don't think it's too outside of the realm. I mean, you see a lot in the colonial struggles where people adopted Marxism as a way to analyze the situation with the power dynamics between the state, the colonizer, 
in their colony situation. Um, there's actually a really interesting article Marcos wrote, and somebody else in the movement wrote, I forget, but I think it was Moises, who was one of the indigenous people in the movement, who's kind of higher up. And they said, it was to an anarchist magazine in the U.S. who was like, oh, you know, these people aren't anarchists, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. They were like, you know, it's good for you that you can sit on your couch and drink coffee in the United States and complain that we're not doing things the way you want them. Um, they're like, most people here don't care about politics. They just want to live their life. You know, most people won't argue with you like I and Moises are going to argue with you right now. And then it was like a two-page <laughs> ripping apart of this poor guy that wrote this article for this magazine. But, I mean, Marcos for sure, like I said, he went to the Chiapas. He went to the south of Mexico in the in the 70s looking to start a revolution based on a Marxist-Leninist model. And the Indians were like, yeah, dude, <laughs> that's not our problem. This is in Mexico City. We're not industrialized. We're not modernized. We're living in poverty. Our problems start with when the Spaniards came here. So as to tension, I mean, I'm, I've never been to the Chiapas. It's kind of, <laughs> it's hard to get to the Chiapas from the state of Mexico today. They have checkpoints. And it's, I mean, they tell you it's a rebel zone. It's really not safe either with paramilitary groups that are always constantly trying to uh, harass and kill these people. And I mean, so I don't, I can't really answer that part about political tension. I mean, if this were not Nicaragua, I could say, yeah, there was tension between the different factions. I of the just movement. meant the tension between yeah. economics on the one hand and ideology and, and I, identity on the other. That's all I was. Thinking. I think, to, I think to them, they kind of go hand in hand. I think the economics, especially with the, de the development of capitalism throughout the world, is kind of a history of installing markets, colonize or colonizing a nation, installing a market, creating a, a need for that or a want for that good. And then after a while, after you destroyed all the, um, how do you put it? After you destroy the, the people who counter that or argue against that, it's fine. It's kind of like the shock doctrine in Latin America in the 1970s. And once you do it, once you've set the laws, it's hard to get rid of those laws. It's hard to reverse what history has done to you. So, I mean, one of their biggest things was they thought the economic policies of NATO were going to ruin their identity, were going to ruin their way of life. So I don't think they're inherently incompatible. I think they actually go really well hand in hand. All right. I suck with this. I, suck. I really am terrible with it. I'll just like you. Um, so based on your research, based on your findings, I don't know if this is working or not. I feel like I'm just using it but not really projecting any voice here. But um, based on your research and your findings, so you said that the National Indigenous Council is planning to elect a, the first time, which is a big deal, a yeah. female president for the 2018 election. Yeah, that's indigenous. Yeah. So, what, in your opinion, how much support is she going to get, considered? because you said that she does not speak the language well, no, right? So how much support is she going to get throughout this election if she really does get elected? Yeah. And what is, in your opinion, what is the outlook on that? I, I think they know they're not going to win. I mean, they say that their base is the support only make up 1% of the Mexican population. And I mean, even though they have thousands of supporters in Oaxaca and throughout the state of Mexico, I mean, the EZLN, which is like it's the military, I'm initially stated, you know, we don't want to be involved in Mexican politics. We're not looking for state power. It's kind of just a symbolic thing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, I mean, these people, they do want to have their voice heard on a national level. And they know with the popularity and the kind of mystique, quote unquote, that goes around their movement, they're going to get heard. And one of the things they're actually arguing for is um, fair wages. They want, I actually have it here. They want fair wages. They want um, public education to be guaranteed in Mexico because right now a privatization surge is happening. And they want environmental protection because, I mean, their biggest thing is their life is the land around them. So <laughs> if that gets destroyed by oil pipelines and um, further climate change in the region, I mean, that's going to ruin their way of life more than the other things ever could. So, I mean, they, they know they're not going to win. I mean, other candidates in Mexico are actually really upset they're running, especially the leftist candidate, because he's like, they're just going to take my votes away. And it's like, they're not going to take your votes away. <laughs> I mean, most of the people that actually do vote in politics locally, they don't vote where you think they would, based on the movement they're in. They actually vote for the PRI, which is kind of a more mainstream Mexican party that stems from the revolution that's more center. So their, their biggest thing is just grassroots level. It's really just a symbolic act at this point, in my opinion. Cody. 
Uh, have the Zapatistas tried to appeal to the international community? If they have, how much success have they, have they received? That's actually really complicated. I mean, I don't think they've ever like appealed to the UN or anything like that, but they might have like complained to the U like complained to someone who's related with the UN. I know there's a football star that plays in Spain who actually was going to play. A f they were going to bring two of the teams over and play in the Chiapas, but there was some increased tensions with the Mexican army at that time, so they didn't. But, I mean, they do have a lot of international support. Um, I mean, they have a website in the States called Schools for Chiapas, and they actually just built a school because of this funding that they received. They'll give you, like, coffee and stuff. But, I mean, I think that is one of the biggest part of their movement is they did want that, that global support. I mean, right now I've read where some of the Kurds that are trying to fight for a, a Kurdistan or, or from Rojava are kind of inspired by the movement where beforehand like the PKK and the YPG were more well especially the PKK was more Marxist Leninist in their trends now they like the model of kind of just that grassroots level you know there's really no federal power to say you have to do this you have to do this you have to do this it's really like the the decisions of everyone so I don't know if they really were looking for international support I think they were happy they got it because it did help them not get slaughtered by the Mexican army but I don't think they were actively being like hey you print this hey you like interview me it was kind of just like they came to them and were like, holy crap, oh, it's 1994 and people are actually rebelling with guns, even though, like I said, most of them were fake, so. Dr. Lipschitz? Um, I'll project. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't need the mic. I wanted to, actually, I wanted to go back and uh, follow up on uh, Professor Combs question. Um, I, it's obvious, I mean, I can understand kind of choosing an indigenous female, um, indigenous woman as kind of as a symbolic, you know, as a symbolic gesture. What about the actual um, composition of this movement? Are there, I mean, like how hard was it for them to find this symbolic woman? Are there actually, you know, because in the photographs you had, right, I mean, everybody's wearing masks. So yeah. I mean, there's kind of this clear in desire to have everybody look the same, but is there a strong presence of women in the, uh, at the grassroots yeah. level? What are the opportunities for them to non-symbolically rise up through the ranks yeah. in, in a meaningful way? Um, okay, that's, that's a lot. Um, actually, one of the biggest things that they wanted to push was more female participation. They actually have female indigenous revolutionary laws that they had where, you know, they tried to kind of increase the, the position of women in their society. Actually, they did, I forget which campaign it was, they actually, they did a tour from the Chiapas to the state of, or to the city of Mexico, and they had um, a woman named Ramona speak who was an indigenous person. She barely spoke Spanish. She had a paper in front of her, and it took her like 10 minutes to read one page, but it was a very symbolic thing. So they, they do, I want these women. They do respect these women's opinions. They're heads of their movement. She was actually, I mean, it was either Marcos could have gone, who's the well-known one, or her, and he was like, she needs to go. She's the face of this movement. I'm just the person everyone loves because I have the biggest mouth, basically. So, I mean, from what I can gather, women's participation is really important in their movement. There's actually, there's a re really good documentary done on them called A Chronicle of a Rebellion, and there's a part where there's like hundreds of just indigenous women on the street when they're bringing in APCs and they're yelling like, go back home, we don't want you. And it might have been a symbolic thing using women with these men in the army being like, you know, you're not going to kill someone who looks like your mother. But it was also just, I think it also just shows the position they have where they don't feel like they need to just stay at home, like they can feel like they can be a part of this movement. So hopefully that helped answer that a little bit. Um, but, sorry, nobody else has their hand up yet, so I'm going to uh, ask the follow-up on this. So, what about, I mean, since earlier, and this now actually goes back to Professor Toole's question, kind of this, you know, the, the tension between the revolutionary ideology and the traditional way of life, um, to what extent, um, you know, and, and I asked this question out of sheer ignorance of not knowing at all what constitutes the traditional way of life of people of this, yeah. you know, of people of this region, uh, other than what you've, you know, what you've told us, how much is women's active participation outside the home seen as an extension of the traditional way of life versus an acceptable, ch like a change that they're willing to accept because it's necessary to protect the traditional way of life, um, or, you know, or is it something new? That's, that's really complicated. I mean, I think one of the things I try to say in my paper is that, to me, it's a colonial struggle 
on top of a struggle within the state of Mexico. Like, a, like, a, like I said, they say that their, con their, their conflicts start from La Conquista. So I don't exactly know what their position of women in society were before the coming of the Spaniards. I, I know in a lot of indigenous societies, they weren't as stratified. It was more of like a needs-based thing as the, the roles they did. But um, I, I mean, I, machismo in Latin America is an interesting thing. I do know there's a problem with femicides in Mexico. There's a problem with um, the, the, what's the, the phrase of the day, toxic masculinity of a lot of people in Mexico, which is the, the patriarchal society. But I, I think their bigger point is that kind of conflicts with their way of life. That it's kind of a thing that was implanted on them by this colonial society, by the state of Mexico. So I don't really think, well, again, like the economy with the politics or with the traditional way, like I don't think they're incompatible. I think it's, one of the things they want to kind of get rid of, well, at least the, the you know, women, you stay in the home, have babies, like they don't want them to just be relegated to that role. Dr. Ieti Cola. Uh, Andrew, I wonder if your um, comparison of Nicaragua and Cuba is, is maybe not the best series of comparisons because we're talking about an indigenous population that's yeah. resisting privatization or de decollectivization of their society. And I wonder, um, and you may have some historians' heads spinning in the audience, but I wonder if the Cherokee um, resistance to a removal and decollectivization and privatization of their land is an interesting parallel um, to this, as well as more modern examples in Latin America in terms of the indigenous population uh, resisting sort of the, their way of life and their collective control over yeah. their, their land. Um, I, I kind of joke at that in my paper. I kind of joke at that when I talk about the juxtaposition of European beliefs that I mentioned in the beginning. It's really, it's really a contextual thing. I mean, I don't think when this happened, people really thought of it in that same sense. I think today some people might look at it more like that because, you know, they actually take what these people say more word for word. But I mean, when I talk to people about Latin American revolutions, you know, when I was in Argentina, I talked to people, they mentioned Cuba, Nicaragua, and the Zapatistas. So that was kind of an interesting thing because, I mean, they are really, they're different. I mean, it is kind of that fight against the decollectivization of their life. They're the forced assimilation into the new way of life. So that might be a more interesting comparison, but I, I do think, I think the comparisons with Cuba and Nicaragua kind of just show its uniqueness, and that's really what I was aiming for. Because, I mean, there's a quote, I'm going to have to swear because it's what the quote says, but um, there's a, a movement in Spain in the Basque region that would do terrorist attacks throughout the 70s and 80s to try and, uh, you know, achieve independence of the region. And they were, actually, they were really bad-mouthing the Zapatistas and Marcos, and they were like, you know, you're not really leftist, you're not really this, you're not really that, you know, don't claim you are. And he's like, I'm not claiming, you know, we're not claiming we are. And his quote back was, I shit on all the revolutionary vanguards of this planet, which is the point of, you know, in, in popular Marxist-Leninist thought, especially with the influence of Lenin, you're supposed to have a party lead the revolution, and then once they do it, they're supposed to guide the people into socialism, into communism. So it was really a jab at that, which I thought was interesting because Marcos kind of has more of the mindset of like the European, you know, of Cuba and Nicaragua, but then with the whole base, I thought it was just interesting to look at the uniqueness of it just in that, and kind of just show the contradictions in lumping these things together. Did that answer it? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I just think about how the revolutions are so different yeah. um, because of the class and ethnic context, particularly yeah. as it relates to the indigenous population. So I, I just think that it'd be interesting to explore another example in yeah. which you can find yeah, what you're doing is superimposing sort of modern day yeah. revolutionary, and that's the context of Commander Marco is coming there with you know, Marxist Leninism. Yeah. And I think that it's really an old story that you mean yeah. that's being told here, and uh, the term genocide yeah. and displacement of indigenous populations. And I hope I could portray that my sarcasm when I when I said that in the beginning, where I said you know people say this is the Marxist revolution. I hope I portrayed a little bit of a sense of. That's ridiculous. I mean, Marcos might be inspired by it, but this is an indigenous thing. So, I mean, I, I think the hard thing with analyzing that is a lot of what's been written or said or been put out was they'd ask questions of, the, of Marcos, of their movement, and they'd respond back. And a lot of it is from this kind of more Eurocentric model where it's not really, 
I mean, it'd be really difficult for the state of Mexico to acknowledge that this stems from the genocide of these people and from really the foundings of their state. I mean, that's kind of, <laughs> that would threaten them a little bit. Well, the nature of the class conflict is so distinct and different. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. You did a great job. Thank you.